There are millions of acres of opportunity out there. They belong to you. Every day, decisions are being made that affect your land, your water, your wildlife. You should know about them. This is your mountain. Welcome to the first episode of the Your Mountain Podcast. I'm your host, David Wilms. With me are my friends and co-hosts, Mike McGrady. Excited to be here. Nephi Cole. I'm still here. Still here. Uh, the three of us have nearly 40 years of collective professional experiences as scientists and lawyers, policy advisors, working around the country on natural resource issues. Uh, we're all also very passionate hunters and anglers and just general outdoorsmen. Uh, we, what we wanted to do with this podcast is we wanted to use a lot of the experiences we've collected over the years and discuss the ways that law, science, and policy converge to affect your outdoor experience. Uh, we're going to do this by sharing our own experiences, but also we wanted to bring in guests that can educate and entertain and provide their experiences to the mix as well. And we certainly have a guest that f fits that bill today. Yep. Uh, really excited. Uh, Steven Ranella, thanks for joining us today. Uh, Steve's the, uh, he's an author, four books, right? Four books. Uh, more than that. More than four? Let me think. Five. Five books. Well, one was a two-parter. Sixth two -parter. November. So, well, yeah, you're right. One was a two-parter. Right? Yeah, it was two parts, man. So it counts. <laughs> the two books. So it counts as two, two books? There are two. When you, okay, lay, okay, when, you, okay. when you lay them out, it's two. Six it was meant to be one, but then my publisher was, was like, you really can't have a seven not that you can't but it's hard to have a 700 page book unless it's like war and peace. in this day and age yeah yeah and so, so i either had to cut out 350 pages or make it make a double you didn't cut out the 350 pages no it? i've done that before and it's painful man yeah so, so you got one coming out later this year too just a, a cookbook okay so i don't even know if that counts as a book but a cookbook no, I, I say it says count book it says book in the title yeah no it's true so it's right that, in so there it counts yeah it's published uh also host of the meat eater tv show podcast of the same name mm -hmm. uh and so I, I have a kindergarten daughter and when i was telling her we were coming out here to uh talk to the meat eater she uh she she's in school she's learning about omnivores and herbivores and carnivores and all that stuff and she said oh he should call himself the carnivore and yeah. she said it just like that the carnivore <laughs> and so i just thought i'd let you know if you're looking into rebranding she's uh she's kind of come up with this when I came up when I came up with that name, it wasn't my intention to have it be like what people thought it was. I have young kids, and at the time I came up with it, I had just like a very one very young son, and he like all kids like you know the books are all dinosaur books for a period of time, um, and in reading the dinosaur books or books about you know large mammals, you'd always get to the T Rex, or you'd get to the grizzly bear part. And the writer always writes the same thing, like the largest meat eater, right? The fearsome meat eater, the T-Rex or the grizzly or, you know, what have yeah, you. Yeah. So I just like that word. So when I came up with that word, I was more referring to not like a, like a statement about myself or something. It's like a big mean animal with little arms. It just was, yeah. <laughs> that's what I was going for, like a yeah, big, <laughs> the big mean scaly creature, or just like like that part of you know, like that is what I meant. It, yeah. didn't, it didn't mean to be something specific, and so yeah, the show's called like Meat Eater, right? Yeah. But it became like the you know, which was which was never intended. But yeah, that's it's kind of what it's turned into. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like, no one cares, right? Yeah, no one cares what you meant. You total total sidetrack here when you talk dinosaurs. You have you've got little kids, yeah. So I saw this thing, you know, the thing that says, you know, with dinosaurs, there are three stages of dinosaur knowledge in your life. It's like on this on this graph. Well, please tell me more because I have a lot of opinions <laughs> about you, this. <laughs> so, so the the three phase the the three people that know most about dinosaurs are three year olds, yeah, parents of three year olds, <laughs> which are just slightly less than three year olds, and then paleontologists, which are kind of right on par with three year olds. Yeah. <laughs> You know, I, I remember the the humorous Jack Hit wrote a, I think it was a profile piece of who's the is Jack, uh, you know, the guy out of Montana State University. Uh, like you know, Jurassic Park is yeah, kind of loosely yeah. based on him. It's um, oh. Jack. 
The uh, writer was Jack I... Hitt, but you know the guy that found all the famous dinosaur bones. Man, you, you know who I'm, I'm talking not about? three. I can't <laughs> I remember. I think you're this talking stuff. to the wrong guy, Steve. <laughs> you know the if you want to talk about Anyways, paperwork, I'm he your pointed guy. out like that. The, the writer was pointing out he's always skeptical of a discipline that seems to be dominated by children. <laughs> <laughs> I think like the ones you know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the ones who know most no, about it, it. It's true. I mean, it's absolutely true. My kids know more about dinosaurs than wiping their own butts. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna be disappointed when they find out they were all fake. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so anyway so so back on it I, I so i don't think we've so last time i saw you uh, i'm i'm seeing this picture of a, a award you received from the theodore roosevelt conservation partnership yeah. i think about a year and a half ago uh, i think that was about the last time i last time i saw you um before that it was you were actually doing a sage grouse hunt mm-hmm. uh which we still haven't aired but we'll be airing soon yeah so you you ended up you ended up getting a satrios. Yeah. Yeah. How was that hunt? It was fun, man. It was good. I'd bumped into them here and there, you know, but I'd never gone like specifically hunting them before. Yeah, so my my theory like I don't do a lot of specifically hunting sage grouse. I always kind of viewed sage grouse as this ancillary species when you're out uh you're out pronghorn hunting or something like that and you happen to just bump a bunch of them and yeah, then like go a, out after like them. Like a right? happy accident. Yeah. Yeah, I could see that. So uh, so you and when you so when you, yeah so you run into them but to actually go look for them becomes different because then you realize then you review in your mind there's like a thing that happens I think when you run into stuff you don't you're not paying attention to how much time you spent not seeing it right yeah because you'd be like and then you review in your mind like oh to go look for them um, sure I'll go find one right away because I bump into them but then and then when you're out there and you're not finding them you're reviewing in your mind that the what what might have been like dozens of man hours per encounter in the past and you kind of like come acutely aware of like how much time you actually weren't bumping into them and what felt like you see them all the time like same thing with blue grouse right so if you go hunt if you're out hunting elk with your bow and you run into blue grouse later you feel like you just ran into blue grouse all the time that's true might go days though but then later when you stop to think about it, like if you're actually out blue grouse hunting, you're not finding any, then you might review in your mind and be like, well, you know, now that I think about it, I walked maybe 36 miles <laughs> for every <laughs> for blue grouse that I blue actually grouse. ran into, even though it feels like you just bump into them all the time. Yeah. And you realize that like, yeah, you go for a long weekend, hike 30 miles and see like a blue grouse. This is like my hunting experience yeah. encapsulated. You know, long time not seeing them. Yeah. Not, not seeing anything. Mike got to eat his first blue grouse a uh, year and a half ago. Yeah. A right. blue grouse or a sage grouse? No, blue, blue grouse. grouse. I'm going to get back very, to sage grouse. Those are very, second. very good. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So we, we were elk hunting. Mike and I were elk hunting. And blue grouse standing on a log, and it was getting down towards sundown. And I, I made a I, All I had was a 30 out six with me, nothing else. I'm like, Mike, how do you feel about ending our hunt early? Because uh, bluegrass <laughs> is standing there. He's, what do you mean? He's like, I'm going to shoot that in the neck. <laughs> like with your thirty out six, yeah, I'm going to shoot it in the neck, and then we're going to have it for dinner. And uh, and the bets and, were exchanged. And we did, and it worked. Yeah, what? I shot it in the neck. I, total, total good. blind luck, I think. But one shot, for one yeah. shot. Yeah, no, it was a good shot. But it was his first bluegrass, and we just, I mean, I don't even know if we did anything but cook it up on the grill. Uh, no, they're one of the better ones. Oh, it's it's phenomenal. Yeah. But. Want to get back to sage grouse because there's. Well, first I want to ask you a question. Yeah, you realize that they're not blue grouse anymore, right? Yeah, they're duskies. I get that. Sooties and duskies. Or sooties and duskies. I know. I get that. I get that. Uh, Political correctness has no place. That's not. It's not it, man. It's it's not it. They're different birds. They are different birds, and and they're duskies where we were. But I grew up. I grew up learning them as blue grouse. Oh yeah. I still I still use it unless I'm talking to someone who. You know, you're always like sussing out, like where is who I'm talking about on sort of the bird awareness spectrum. Yeah, no, you can call and me if out. I on feel that, that, and if I feel like they're high on the bird awareness spectrum, I'll, I'll at least acknowledge that I, I realize that the, the name has changed. Yeah, no, I get it. I get it. I'm still, I'm still. I have the same problem birds, with but... buffalo and bison. Yeah, like who depends on who I'm talking to. It's sad. I, what the word I use depends who I'm talking to. I'm. No, I agree with you. I do the same thing. Although I teach my kids, I, I always use bison. I always say bison. Uh, I find myself now being like... I always say buffalo every Grudgingly, time. I use pronghorn now. I do that too. Uh, Which has been a hard shift That is me. a tough shift. I'm, I'm with you too. I do the same thing. But I want to go back really quick to your sage grouse experience. So you, 
did you see so you, you killed you got one you got at least one sage grouse i can't remember if i got one my buddy got one i got one i can't remember if we got two or three total you got a big old bomber didn't you that's right Just Don't a, they call it? yeah, yeah bombers. big old yeah. bomber big old male sage grouse yeah i like think i think we turkey. each got one yeah okay and so we could have we could have chased them down more yeah but. so did you end up did you eat that one yet yeah yeah any good? Not as good as blue grouse. <laughs> that doesn't really answer the question, though. It's a fair point. No, not bad. Uh, darker, like dark meat. Yeah, I've heard that description before. You know what I actually felt that it seemed like? It seemed like when I thought, like when you cook the breast, it seemed almost like a like an like an antelope tenderloin. Sorry, a pronghorn tenderloin. <laughs> like like had that same kind of you know because I think they're probably feeding a lot of the same kind of grub. Yeah, had the same kind of thing. Well, no, not as good as the blue grouse, but definitely not something that I wouldn't pursue. You know, like so, after eating a coyote, I lost all interest in coyotes. Yeah, right? yeah. I just ruled it. I was like, that's not like a food item I'll pursue. But you haven't lost interest in. You didn't chase so how did, grouse again. So how'd you how'd you prepare it? Gr- well, grilled. Like did the did the like braise the legs in a pan just to tenderize them, uh-huh. and then grilled the breast, seasoned them, and grilled them. Because I got away. Because I've, so I've been hunting sage grouse since I was you know old enough to hunt, and I've so I've got a way that I've tried to prepare them. Um, it's way more time intensive and labor intensive than what you just described. I start about three days before I actually cook it, and I soak it in salt water, then I soak it in tap water, uh, then I soak it in buttermilk, and then yeah. I have a marinade, and I and I'll do it in marinade, and then I'll cook it on the stove and. In like olive oil, I'll get it into some like nice and medium rare. And, yeah, and then I put it in the dog dish. <laughs> <laughs> feed, and I feed, feed it. Feed oh, so it. You're not a fan uh, of sage grouse. You know, I, I'm not. A, it's it's not one of my favorite. I, I so I have this thing. If I'm gonna hunt it, I'm gonna eat it. So I don't really feed it to the dog. I yeah, yeah, but, I get, but, but it's not like it's, a top. It's not, it's not like your a, favorite. It's not like a top fifty kind of yeah. uh, food for me. Uh, but I will say. Uh, that last year I did find something on a sage grouse that I thought was pretty good, and it was <clears throat> nothing that I knew, uh, nothing that I knew of before. I took my daughter up to do a turkey hunt, uh, you know, four hours north of town, on this old rancher's place, and I, I got to know him when I was a field biologist years and years ago. He's an old Korean War fighter pilot. Used to when I was working in the field, he used to buzz me in a little plane that he had, scare the crap out of me uh, when we're out in the field. But like he was having flashbacks. No, it's just he just like yeah, maybe. <laughs> Dave's just, having flashbacks. Just, just just something he like to do. But so we go up and we stay at his place. Yeah. And uh he and he's in his mid eighties, you know, really nice guy. And his wife makes this just unbelievable meal. Uh so we're sitting down at the dinner table and start eating this thing. And he runs into the kitchen to grab something else for the meal. He's like, Gotta do one other one last thing. Uh, and it was what I found was the best part of sage grouse, and so I wanted to bring you some of it. The best on the plane. You brought. I this. brought this on the plane. There's a little story behind it's it. It's Not a bunch of eggs. It's not a bunch of eggs. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh. <laughs> beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Are these right? all genuine sage grouse? These are droppings? these are genuine sage grouse droppings. Uh, <laughs> And no kidding. And I don't know. I, don't, I used to have a large collection of animal droppings. I know. I know. So that, I knew that. So that's but why. When I had it, this was missing from the collection. So now you have a bunch, and you only need a few for the collection. The other part you need them for. Incense. Incense. My brother burns moose droppings for incense. Have you ever Have you ever smelled a sage grouse? No. Can I do it? Yeah. Do it. Hey, this is This is not easy. What's, what's the word? This is not easy stuff to find. What do you want to say? Just this like is, that. Yeah. So. <laughs> So when we decided we wanted to bring this to you, it was, yeah, I think you got on stage grass, you got to hold it for like 15 seconds, get it on fire. Yeah, my brother took to burning uh, moose droppings that are made out of willow, and he burns them in his house. Our kids love it. Yeah. The moose so dropping has, incense. This has kind of a sage God, incense does, smell to man, it. Look at that. that. And that thing will burn for like That's incredible. 15 minutes. And I've been around sage grass since I was... So, know, so the guy added this to the he, dish? He put, no, he put it right on the middle of the table. <laughs> Put it right on the middle of the table just to add the ambiance as we're having this big steak really? dinner, right? Yeah. And, I, and I've been around sage grouse my entire life, and it wasn't until last year that I learned about this. And, uh, Best part of the bird no, right there. And my, and my daughter had her face just buried over it, <laughs> wafting the smoke into her face. And, uh, but, yeah, each one of these will burn for 15 minutes. I, uh, so I have, I have 
weeks worth of smoke. <laughs> you got a lot. You got, yeah, there got to be that's, fifty in there. That's, that's so, tough to replenish. So you just so you I, know, I found the 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 only redeeming quality about social media. I put out a call on social media, and maybe the first time this has ever been done. I put out a call on social media and said, "I am in need of some sage grouse droppings." And I had a buddy, Brian, thank you very much, at Game and Fish, who the next morning was actually heading out to do a Lex le- site visit. Oh, really? That's and where he went, found it? And he went and found it, and he priority mailed it to me. Uh, and then I, you know, then I packed it on the plane. So we, I, I now great, know man. you can take that through security for anybody out there listening. You can take uh, animal droppings through security. Yeah, a whole, a Did they ask about them. it? No, they didn't. Nothing. Just went right, right on through. I've had them flag stuff where they pulled it out because they recognized, what do they call it, an organic mass <laughs> <laughs> would be their description of a hunk these of meat. Just look like, <laughs> they just thought these were packing peanuts, just a whole. Yeah. Well, thank you, man. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thought, uh, you know, you've written on it before, right? And I knew you, uh, at least with Moose, and, yep. uh, and that you... You actually have a bit of a collection, and didn't know if this is one you had. No, but this also, is great. We're this is, it's an educational opportunity. You know, this has a pretty nice odor to oh, it. Oh, and like, and like, yeah, and, like, and kids get excited. I mean, one just because you're lighting something on fire, they like that a lot. Yeah. And then also just like <laughs> poop, which is big. Yeah. So it's just got everything a kid would want. Man. And it's like, got a nice smell. poop and burning. But there's there's <laughs> some poop that when you burn doesn't smell that good. Exactly. Like Mike's. <laughs> uh. No, that's good stuff, man. I'm going to I'm tell my brother about this because, he, like I said, he's into the moose. He actually gives out his Christmas gifts. He gives <laughs> bags of moose droppings out for Christmas gifts. Uh, is how into it he is. Well, I'm, I'm not going to lie. I held on to some of them. Uh, he, he, Brian actually sent quite a bit more than this, and I held on to a little bit for myself for uh, – because I thought, you know, I might want to have this uh, around the house. We were talking about... Or outside the house. My wife has made it pretty clear it'll be outside the house. <laughs> we were talking about sage grouse and, and, and people's palates, and we brought, uh, we brought a gift for you, a book about the Lewis and Clark expedition. Interestingly enough, the one animal that even starving men try and avoid... Is what? Sage, sage grouse. Mer- <laughs> Meriwether Lewis, in his own journals, talks about the sage grouse as being sort of... Tolerable, which I think in that time was as about as close as you could get to. I'd rather die than eat this bird. Well, here's the thing, though they had they had such different like like people had different expectations and different tastes back then. Because you'll also find his what was his favorite fish? I don't know. Moon eyes. Oh yeah, yeah. You know what that fish? I don't. It's like a it's like a bony large out of the Yellowstone. They were eating moon eyes. It's like a shiner. Yeah, okay. It's like a it's like a very compressed like tall laterally compressed shiner that's full of bones meanwhile they're eating all kinds of fish out of that river and he liked that which people now regard as like which people now regard as like not an edible fish makes you wonder why you look at like people like eating hickory shad and people like roche like back then like george washington jefferson all those guys their favorite fish was like all the the different shad species was now people like like the row out of them but you know to, to eat one a friend of mine equated it to trying to fix a watch, picking the bones out of those fish. <laughs> so it's like people had. So the fact that he didn't like something that's good, the fact that they like they like <laughs> stuff that's not good, it's just like a different yeah, I'm, bunch of requirements. I, I'm I'm glad you like it, but it's I'm not. It's just like not it. that bad. It's, it's there's not. things that I've lost. There's things I've lost interest in going after over time because just like food wise, like we used to hunt a lot of golden eyes and buffalo heads. And now it's saying, I'll be like, you know, I just would like rather go after like the pochard waterfowl species or go after puddle ducks. They're just better. You know? Yeah. No, I'm with you. But and, and no, I didn't it didn't strike me as being like offensive. It's not it's not inedible, but it's not top shelf. It's it's not middle shelf. It's <laughs> <laughs> how much of it is though, like I mean really there's a there's a piece. How much is mystique? To, to tell you the truth, largely mystique. Whatever we say, like I, I'll chase stuff because I'll eat stuff because I love to chase it too. I mean, there's something about getting there, and I mean, there's a piece of like the environment it came from that's like just cool. Yeah, I'm yeah, totally that, with you, man. So that was where you hunt. I mean, that was a pretty cool environment uh, where you were hunting sage grouse, right? Let's I give mean, the lat launch for everybody. Yeah, Dave, no, let's, let's not do that. But that was a. It, I, I always kind of revere, and I don't know how your experience was there, but I kind of view that area as. Sort of the Serengeti of Wyoming, because yep. you can, you can uh, when you're out there hunting sage grouse, you can see elk, you can see pronghorn, mule deer, 
a few whitetail, uh, not really many, but uh, then you got your sage grouse, and uh, I mean, just there's this whole collection of all of the North American mammals, really, uh, plains mammals that are just right there. And then you can sit there at night and not see a person. You can hunt all day and not see a soul. And it kind of, it, it's as close to a wilderness type of experience as you can have without being in a, you know, wilderness with a big W. Yeah, it's like open country wilderness. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Which is rare, man. Yeah, yeah. That's That area is going to change a lot. It's going to change a lot in the next few years. It might not be the same kind of open country of, wilderness. Because of the wind farm? We're yeah, not going to talk about but we're that. Not, no, we're not. No, we're not. But, uh, but yeah, things like that are changing. What I, but I really did kind of want to talk about wilderness, because, you know, what, when I was thinking about that, we were talking sage grouse and thinking about sage grouse, I got, got to looking and there's actually, so we have something like 110 roughly million acres of wilderness as in designated, congressionally designated wilderness. Yeah, it's like, uh, what is it, is it a percent or 2% or something the American... Uh, is, is designated wilderness? Yeah. It's small. Yeah. But then look at it in BLM and of all of that, only 7 million acres is designated as wilderness in BLM on you know Bureau of Land Management lands. It's almost all on National Forest National Parks. Yeah. It makes some sense because the original Wilderness Act uh, in what, 1964 right. uh, was set up and it only allowed you to designate National Park and National Forest land. It wasn't until the you know decade they later. The, they didn't give the BLM wilderness, the no. BLM ability to designate wilderness. Builder, BLM couldn't do it until about a decade later until... Uh, FLIPMA, the Federal uh, Land Management Policy yeah, Act. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Which kind of helps explain a little bit why um, why the wilderness areas are, you know, as they say, rock and ice. Yeah. Because, yeah. like, a lot of, you know, because a lot of that stuff was out of the, the stuff that became the wilderness was sort of like your highest, most isolated patches of ground that seemed least likely to have economic. To, you know, least likely to be developed for other economic does that, activities. Does that cheapen the perception of what wilderness is? I mean, as an honest question, I mean, if our perception of wilderness is always rock and ice so people can't get here, you know, what's the thought behind the, the, the actual thought behind creation of wilderness? And does it, does it do wilderness an injustice to have it be perceived, even if it's not that, to have it be perceived as just one thing? I, I don't know. I think that, I don't know if it does it. I think what it does is it sets in people's minds. It might set in people's minds like what is suitable for. You know, like, like I remember, you know, Aldo Leopold, um, when he was kicking around and, and advocating on the behalf of creating something, like like an early version of something that would sort of become designated wilderness, his selling point was that it's he was looking to places where the greatest value and in some ways the only value of it would be to be it. That it was like places where there's sort of like no other thing that would compete with that the value of wilderness. There was like no other opportunity to be harvested, you know, no other opportunities that were readily apparent there. Like when you're thinking in the idea of today's day and age, when we talk about you know, public lands and we we talk multiple uses, that the idea was with wilderness, multiple use might have only been one use. Yeah, it was just like too rugged, too high. There's like there's no grazing interest there. Although Oftentimes, there are grazing interests in wilderness. For sure. Yeah. But, but, but no, when, when they were identifying some early pieces, right, they were identifying and talking about early pieces, they were generally looking at places where they just imagined there being not a lot of resistance. Meaning that, uh, that, that some of the common interests who wanted to not do the designation would look and be like, well, sure. Like, who's going to really do anything up there? Well, and, and when you figure, uh, you know, of the 107 million acres... 44 million of them are in national parks. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, so wilderness can be designated in national parks as well. Oh, I had so no that, idea, that really. makes it a pretty easy designation Yeah, it, for in a lot of these places. I had no idea. Yeah. But the point I was getting at with the BLM is that, you know, I mean, the BLM has a lot of holdings that are more, that are lower elevation, flatland holdings. And when people, people who are big wilderness advocates now will look and say, well, the problem with our wilderness system is we don't have big eastern we, you know we, we don't have a strong presence in the east we don't have a strong presence at lower elevation there's not a big wilderness presence in large riparian zones and they'll look and say that it was sort of a whatever the intent was at the time people will look and be like we need to round out the portfolio 
of designated wildernesses to include other habitat types besides these high elevation yeah, that, that's, like, that, that's like that's a perspective on the wilderness. That, that it's like a, that it was an incomplete job. It was, and so they with FLIPMA they allowed for BLM designations, but you've still you had FLIPMA. Yeah, the Federal Land Planning Management Act, uh, FLPMA, right? FLMPA. Well, Federal Land Pl- Management Planning Act. Yeah, yeah, got the got them flip. There's too many acronyms. It, but it, no, it's Flipma. Flip, 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 yeah. Flip yeah. So it's yeah. the it's the BLM. It's the statute that oversees management of BLM land. Okay. Right, and so it authorized um, the the creation of or recommendations for the creation of wilderness on BLM, but it just never really materialized. And I think largely because of point you made. If you take a map of the energy resources of the country, yeah. and, oh, at least of the Western United States where all the BLM is, and you overlay that on on public lands, you or on BLM lands, you're not going to find a lot of places where you want to that you want to take out of potential production for sure uh, and turn into wilderness areas. So it seems like we've made a on BLM land a value judgment of uh, you know, this multiple use mandate, and we've decided there might not be a place for that use. So we've got a here. lot of wilderness quote-unquote wilderness study areas but very few instances have they taken the additional step of deciding after the study what does it become correct right and mike you might know a little bit more about that i think you've done some maybe you've done some work with that but i think I mean, there, because there's political resistance to it there, there's or, yes there, there can be some local resistance to to taking areas that are uh it's, what are they what, have wilderness characteristics or something right yeah they're managed essentially for wilderness because they're in the pipeline for potential congressional review and approval. Um, and so they, during that period of time, they have to manage them as if um, they are going to be wilderness so they don't have some sort of resource use that would take away that wilderness characteristic. And um, There's a big it, push by a lot yeah. of groups right now to say, hey, let's, let's, make the, let's take the next step. Let's see that they are or they aren't. And that's, that's gotten a lot of traction. Yeah, it's giving it that, that official... Thumbs up, thumbs down. Yeah, uh, kind of that Roman gladiator moment. On, on that issue, I mean, personally, generally, I'm, I'm generally a thumbs up guy. Are you make it wilderness? <laughs> generally, because I just that's only me coming at it from what I view to be like long term societal challenges. What do you right? mean? What do you mean? I just feel like in the long run, in twenty five, fifty, one hundred years from now, we would be more glad as a nation. We would be more glad that we made that decision than if we made the other decision a hundred years from now. And the other decision being saying I think that we would over time we would realize as a nation we would realize greater value in having designated more wilderness rather than less. I don't think in a hundred years we'll be like, Man, I'm sure glad we developed this stuff. I'm sure glad we didn't make this wilderness. <laughs> It won't be something people say in 100 years. People will not be like, what happened to all the roads? There used to be roads. Now we don't have any. I just, I, I can't picture that being the conversation in the future. Yeah, no, there'll be, fortunately, it's just, it's just, neither one of us will know, be, uh, just be around to I think, that like, generally we go back, because, like, in taking the long-term perspective on it, we generally go back and think that the people, people had good ideas when it came to anything to do with habitat preservation. It's generally regarded, like, now... Any politician would like to be favorably compared to Roosevelt. Right? Oh, oh, yeah. And Any politician would like to. We carved his face on a giant rock, and millions of people go over there every year to look at his face on a rock. And we're like, wow, the, the, you know, the Midnight Forest, what leadership to have done that. What audacity. He saw the future. You know? what, what, a, what clarity of mind. And how controversial it was at the time. You, you know, he, it was more, that was more, what he was doing then was more controversial than anything we're talking about right now. In his own day and age. And now he's a visionary. So it's like, if, if you came in right now, I'm just saying like, and not talking about any particular spot. And my view is, if you, whatever you did right now, in 100 years, Americans will be like, man, glad they did that. Yeah, so, so I universally at, accepted. So I, I look at Teddy Roosevelt. A, I won't say differently because he was a he was a great visionary. But but one thing that I think sometimes is overlooked is he he was kind of this blend of John Muir and uh, Gifford Pinchot. Right? Of he had this idea of he wanted preservation of mm-hmm. some places, 
but it seemed like it was tugging at him more to make sure that we had conservation as in so we could have a sustainable yield. So, you know, you point, he puts Gifford Pinchot as, in as the chief of the Forest Service. Yeah. And, and the whole idea being we need to manage this as a cash crop, as a, as a commodity For sure. year after year after year. And that seemed to be – I mean, he had – visions of of damming up parts of yosemite for for waterway projects yeah. and it had this vision of of uh, a connected series of rivers that they would would be dredged out around the country for commerce and yeah uh so and i think sometimes some of that stuff is forgotten but you, but you, always, but you have to compare him relative to his context i agree with you no i agree with so you. relative to his context he was a radical yeah i agree at the time at the time for sure so sure you might now go look the same way you can now go look and be like well you know thomas jefferson really um, as much as they talked about the rights of all men and in and, and tyranny, uh, he owned slaves. So therefore, let's disregard everything that Thomas Jefferson ever said because we now realize that viewed from a contemporary lens, he wasn't a visionary. Yeah. But it was like relative to his times, he was talking about some audacious stuff, like audacious ideas. He did. And he did set – he laid the groundwork for being able to have this the series of environmental laws that came later in the 20th century. And he was, going head to head with the, he was going head to head with the robber barons. He was, yeah. So the fact that he wasn't, yeah, it would have been like, where would he even been coming from at the time in you know the early 1900s if he would have been coming in and saying like, oh, and we're not even going to log it. It would have been like an idea that wouldn't even have been, <laughs> yeah. you couldn't even imagine. No, that's true. But you know they're coming from a period where there's virtually no, like he's watching wildlife get exterminated. And um, forests get wiped out. Yeah, and he just knew that we're gonna like you have to create, we're gonna have to, like start the task of like setting aside some area for wildlife to exist if we're gonna have wildlife. I mean, he watched, you know, the raping and pillaging of the land, and learned something from it. On the wilderness debate, this is this is it's just accurate. It's it's like kind of like almost like ger- not the wilderness debate. And what I'm saying about the future is almost like germane, right? It's like it's it's an academic exercise. I'm just pointing out that if you Okay, if you took every wilderness study area right now and, des- and just gave it full balls designation, wilderness designation, mm-hmm. and then you went and polled Americans 100 years from now and told them the breakdown and what the, current, what the contemporary debate was in 2018, I'm telling you, they would overwhelmingly, I'm, if we can make a time capsule bet, I'm telling you, they would overwhelmingly say like, oh, that was the right decision based on what we're looking at now, which is net-net radically less wildlife habitat, fewer animals on the global landscape. That is probably right. I mean, with and they would be like, sure, it was a smart move to do that because if it wasn't that, it would be even worse than it is now. Yeah, well, I mean, with population encroachment going all over the place, human population, human footprint going. Because so, you're going you're to continue to view it in a global perspective. You're going to yeah. continue to view it in a global perspective. So, so play a little devil's advocate, though. I mean, can you see how... You know, one of the can you see? I think one of the challenges of of wilderness and wilderness study there is you know. So, for example, like us in Wyoming, we're super lucky, right? Mm-hmm. We have wilderness air every, everywhere. Yeah, it's hard for you guys to see the end. And so, for people, and so for people looking out their back door, they want another wilderness area. You're like, well, you know, we have a lot of wilderness areas. But I'm not talking about what people think right now, and I'm not even yeah. talking about You're, what I think right now. I'm telling well, you what the future generations which brings will me think. to a great That's question a, for which you. Is really tough a to great argue. Great question guys, for right? you. Yeah. You you know so what if and I think I know the answer, but if somebody to say to you, so what's the thing that you love, love doing in the wilderness the most? What's the thing that you value that country for? What if they were to come to you and say, you don't get to do that there anymore? Oh, if I had to make that deal with the devil, I've talked about this before. Oh, I know. So if you went and said like with, with Anwar, okay, I've hunted in Anwar. I've hunted in um, the NPRA, so the National Petroleum Reserve in Alaska. If I had to make a deal with the devil, and someone said, here's the deal. We won't develop it, but you can't ever step foot on it again. I'd be like, done. Where do I sign? Not a problem. So you feel that strongly about wilderness that you'd say, you know what? If we really, I mean, if it really had to be truly hands off, you're like, thumbs up. Like, uh, yeah, I'll do the hands off part too. Only because in the long game, globally, I feel that we're going to run out of. Um, in the long game, globally, we're just going to continue to run out of, uh, you know, it, it's so hard to say the word. Like when I say wilderness, we're going to run out of lowercase wilderness. So, so, so the there's best a- way to hang on to lowercase wilderness in my mind, like a good way to hang on to lowercase wilderness in my mind is by going with the uppercase wilderness. So, so it's th- helpful. And you know, I'll point out, man, while we're on the subject, you yeah. know what the vote was when they passed the Wilderness Act? 
it probably a lot like most of them back then. They were pretty much unanimous. Ninety nine to yeah. one. You know what the dissenting vote was? It didn't go far enough. Ninety nine to one. Yeah. Well, Endangered Species Act was the same way. Passed yeah, with by something a, signed I mean, by a Republican. Signed by a Republican president. Yeah. Clean Water Act, Clean Air Act, National Environmental Policy Act. Uh, yeah, Wilderness Act, all of these acts that were passed in that same time frame, in that same kind of vacuum in time. People were like, people could see the end. This people could see the end very clearly. There's like a lot of upheaval, and I think people got really nervous about the future. And, and now we're going through kind of a, a new upheaval. Uh, so there's this, so there's this renowned biologist out there. Uh, I don't know if you, E.O. Wilson. No, I know E.O. Wilson. You know E.O. Wilson, yeah. So he's he wrote this book. I mean, book. I don't know him personally, but yeah, I'm yeah. very familiar with his so, work. Yeah, yeah, so have you read his book, Half Earth? Nope. Uh, me either. <laughs> <laughs> I, was really, right I really was kind of hoping you had. No, no. Uh, so I've gone to a couple of talks that E.O. Wilson done, he, okay. has done. He talks about his book, Half Earth. And it's really one that I actually do kind of want uh, to, to read. But he talks about this. If we take today and we, you know, to save species all around the globe, his theory is, if I get this right, his theory is we need to protect half of all of the available habitat that's there today. Hmm. And if we do half Earth, you know, half of what's there, half today. of what's there, half of what we got, you know, and and protect it in a way that's similar to a big W. I'm talking like oh, set it aside. So that's a revolutionary like idea. Set, it's revolutionary. Set it aside, half Earth, that we will slow down the rate of extinction, and we can actually save a lot of these See? species globally, and we can ensure that we've got. And, and it's this it's this whole changing mm -hmm. uh, field of. You know, population ecology, and, um, and I'm forgetting the, the the term that's really kind of developed over the past you know 15 or, or 20 years that he really uh, ascribes to. But yeah, E.O. Wilson, yeah, that's so half Earth, like protect think, half of it forever. Yeah. It sounds like that's kind of, I mean, you're 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 sounds like as much as you can possibly get. Uh, but here's the deal: We're, uh, I'm painting in broad brushstrokes. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so. All of this becomes all of this becomes different the minute you start going like, well, what about that little piece of ground right there? Oh, of course. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm not talking about that little piece of ground. I'm not talking about what some specific individual is looking at when they regard like their current job and their prospects of their business and the ability to provide for their family. I know that everything gets exceedingly muddy. I'm talking about as a like a rule, a general as a general principle, personally. As informed by what I view will be the national perspective in the future, I think that we need to stop the bleeding on habitat loss. Here's one of the challenges I think you really face, and I, I mean, I'm sure that this is real. And I think we do tend to look at this issue and a lot of issues like this. We look at them from these polar opposites, from this left and this right side of like, we either all it's all in or all out. Yeah. And I think what we're missing is that, you know, there are management decisions that are being made in regards to big W wilderness, in regards to areas that have wilderness type characteristics. There are management decisions made in the middle that if we do those right, you know, that I truly believe, you know, we can keep these things around. We can provide these opportunities. We don't have to choose between never being able to go into someplace wonderful and special and having it exist. You know, we can have both of those things if we're responsible in our management. And I think, you know, as a country, I got to believe that the more urbanized we get, the more people see that. And as, and I, I think it's missionary work of going out and saying, look, everybody, we got to stay acquainted. We got to stay in touch. We have to be going out into wilderness areas. Don't, you know, don't make a mess when you go out there. But in my mind, you really risk losing people's interest in having those areas if you can't keep the wild piece of your of, of people, the wild piece of yourself, acquainted with them. Oh, absolutely, man. I agree. I agree, hundred percent. And and the thing about me, like saying, like, oh, I'll never step foot on Anwar or the NPRA again. I mean, it, it, you know, I'm. It, that's like a hypothetical scenario that isn't going to come up. And it's also being like a little bit extreme to, a, to sort of demonstrate a perspective. I'm not like really advocating on that you don't go there because I think that the visitation issue. The reason you can't lay a finger on Yellowstone is in no small part like thanks to the fact of look at the visitor rates of the place. If it, if we had create if that first national park had been created and they said like no one could ever step foot there ever. It's that pristine. Like what would sort of be its public perception? Yeah. 
right? You wouldn't have it wouldn't have the ad, the public advocacy that it enjoys if it was that you can't touch it. But it's th- then it creates an interesting dilemma of what happens when you touch it too much. Yeah. Which is, when you're talking Yellowstone, that's you're starting to hear that. Are, are we loving it to death? Sure. You know, tourism. A lot of our too, national parks. Yeah, a lot of the national parks. But uh, that's kind of what, that's also another reason why, like. When I used to live in the, you know, what's now regarded as the GYE or you know Greater Yellowstone Ecosystem, when I used to live there, I used to, I used to be baffled by the fact of the way people would go into that block of ground and subject themselves to all the just the onerous, you know, management and permission getting and being told what to do and where to do and where to sleep. When you could cross the street, right, and go in all these other like vat, like the wilderness areas outside of there. And have all of that same suite of megafauna, no one around, and be able to just kind of like do your own thing. Yeah, so, so I used to always be like, like people would be like, oh, I'm going backpacking in Yellowstone. I'm like, dude, why would you go there? <laughs> See, <laughs> you, I mean, you bring up an interesting you know point, though. You can though. go backpacking like, like, outside yeah, of Yellowstone, yeah, yeah, right? You bring up an interesting point, though, because I, I, do, I, do, I love to backpack in the GYE, uh, not in Yellowstone, outside of Yellowstone. And what's kind of fascinating is, I mean, you talk about do whatever. It, we'll do it that we'll do no, it no, within you know wilderness areas are interesting to me in a way they're kind of paradoxical because the idea is we're protecting this place to keep you know the, and this state of mind of this this place where you go there and you feel like I, I have a buddy that when we go backpacking he just says this is a libertarian paradise mm-hmm. I can do whatever I want I want to go skinny dipping I'm going to go skinny dipping but if, to get to get to that, he might say he might be better said not do whatever you want, go wherever you want. Yeah, well, he doesn't say that. <laughs> uh, in his mind, it's a true libertarian paradise. Yeah, you where, can't run a generator. Yeah, but but a libertarian would be able to want to run his generator. But but the thing is, it's it's also even in in wilderness areas outside of the GYE, you got to have certified weed free fee weed free hay for your horses. You got to yep. pack in your own hay. Uh, you got to camp a certain distance away from streams and trailheads. You got to, depending on the drainage in, you got to bury or pack out your own waste. Uh, you got to have bear proof containers, especially in the GYE. It's just this laundry list of the things that you have to do in order to have this wilderness experience. But the and, list isn't as bad as what you'd get in the park. I've never slept in a no, national no, no. park. No, I mean, it's, they tell you where to sleep, the GPS location of where to sleep and how long you're allowed to be there. Yeah. And like, you got to be out by 11 a.m. because the next dudes are coming in right behind you. Uh, yeah, I get that. It's, it's just, more It's more managed. It's just, it's interesting to me uh, that, you know, wilderness areas with the big W, wilderness areas. And you can't are, take your bike. You can't take your bike. You, uh, I mean, there's all sorts of stuff you can't do. And evidently there's, I mean, you so you've filmed in – have you filmed in wilderness areas? Yeah. Yeah, we've, we've pulled some film permits in some wilderness areas. It just depends if it's a we, – we, we're not able to get permits in, like, big-name wilderness areas that have a lot of demand for permits and they have, a lot of, they have, like, a lot of recreational use. But there's some wilderness areas around that, that um, they welcome uh, – if you include some messaging in it and talk about the intent of the Wilderness Act and, and put that on there, we have gotten film permits in wilderness areas, but these are wilderness areas that, that are – go almost un, you know, unutilized from from that commercial perspective but so we like if you go to apply like i've applied for permits in hell's canyon you know the wilderness area in hell's canyon and you, you can't even you're just rejected out of hand right because i think that because of the nature of the place and the high visitation rates they're dealing with so much demand that they've had to just really stick to the to the core principles of what goes on there even though you can run jet boat tours up and down the place and do pack in mule train hunts. Two guys with a camera the size of a thirty-five millimeter yeah. camera can't get a permit, which is frustrating. But I understand how the decisions are made. But we've had other wilderness areas where they're like, "Really? Please, <laughs> here's what I need out of this. Like, you need to make yeah. sure to to do me right on X, Y, and Z." And this is the first time we've ever had a permit request for this wilderness area. Do, do you find that uh, depending on which region, Forest Service region you're dealing with, you you have the the procedures that they apply or the the, the perception scrutiny they put yes, the scrutiny they put yeah, on the permit I have is different. found I have found and, and I don't want to get into this you know you don't have to say which ones <laughs> well I already named Hell's yeah, Canyon yeah. um and I you know and I tried to I tried to appeal the Hell's Canyon decision uh and uh, appealed it one round and then and then didn't get any further than that just on technicality issues and I never felt that my appeal my appeal was really heard um. In other places, 
you know, I haven't done it enough to say like geographically, but we have gotten permits in the southwestern U.S. to film on wilderness areas. But again, these are not high visitation. These aren't like large landscape scale high visitation wilderness areas that see a tremendous amount of traffic and see a lot of people applying for commercial permitting. I, I think the part of the challenge that a lot of people have with, it'll be honest, with government in general, is that you know a lot of the same laws and policies are driven at these different offices, and a lot of it, frankly, there's a lot of individual discretion given to people in the in the middle tier that bureaucracy, and we deal with them all, and they're great people. Right. It's no. It's totally subjective. That's what I found. It's yeah. totally subjective. It's it, it's to challenging. a frustrating degree. Yeah, and it can be really challenging for people. And, and my perspective on it again, and this is a little bit. I don't want to take this too far off topic. My perspective on it is, you're like, it's it's. There's two areas where I have perspective on the on the simple question of filming, which isn't relevant to most people who be listening to this. But one thing is, you're already looking at areas that have a tremendous amount of com- there's, there's already a lot of commercial activity in these wilderness areas. So, for instance, someone can lead, you know, you can do pack like pack train tours that even integrate jet boat elements into a pack train tour, where you're having large groups of people going out, twenty horses. Big, huge campground setups, right? This is a commercial activity. Outfitters are out there guiding hunts as a commercial activity. So you're allowing certain ones, but they look at when it was written out, and they look at the filming element of it, and I think that some of the filming element of it is meant to address back when people were filming westerns and setting up fake towns and bringing in helicopters yep. in parking lots and stunt drivers, yep. and they have a set of filming requirements that seems to be more addressing that type of use. Yep. From what you'd see now, from a modern perspective, of much like uh, equipment that can be carried around in an individual backpack, yeah. much lower footprint. So I think that the permitting process is antiquated, and they're addressing a demand. Um, they're, they're sort of trying to use like a one size fits it's, all. It's one door, and everybody has to walk through that same door. It's just the the misunderstanding is that now, like technology's changed uses have changed where now everybody still has to come to the same door and walk through the same hallway to get the same things but now when you open that door there's a hundred different options on the other side and and most of them don't look like a hollywood movie set and i think that there's a reluctance to in some point people that i've dealt with um and and this is coming from a like i'm a pro wilderness person so i believe in the core mission and and what and the thing i've always tried to articulate is is what what i would like to do is in you know in line with the core mission Right. Yeah. What's compatible and, 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 with wilderness? Me, even for me to argue the point, I'm not arguing the point because I'm in opposition to wilderness. I'm not like doing that sort of thing. I'm arguing the point is, listen, I'm a wilderness advocate. I think that this is in line with extremely low impact, far lower impact than many of the other commercial activities on the landscape out here. And I would like to do this from the perspective of explaining the relevance and importance yeah. Yeah. of wilderness. Yeah, and- and so that's like the case I pleaded. But again, you know, I, I hesitate to get into this too much because it's just it's particular to right. It's relevant to who? Yeah, well, no, but it's, it's relevant to, to people. And, and it, it's interesting to know how yeah, how commercial use is regulated in a wilderness area. I mean, it's interesting to know that if we all went on an elk hunt and into a wilderness area and took which we wouldn't you know, do because. David, I have to get some new boots or something. And I always have good boots. You won't want to get geared up. Oh, I always have good boots. What size do you wear? Yeah, I always have good boots. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but if we were all four to go on an elk hunt in a wilderness area and we'd have a string of pack horses, you know, that we were hauling all our gear in, we wouldn't have to get any permit. But if two of you went in and took camera, uh, a couple of cameras and wanted to film it, you could you be take denied your, an if opportunity. You take your iPhone in. And in some ways, why I think the public should care is – if you're denied a permit and you have – you're denied a filming permit and there's only going to be two or three of you back in there, it's denying the public. Most of the public never gets into these wilderness areas. Yeah. The vast majority of the public never gets into these wilderness areas. So by denying the permit, it's denying an opportunity for the general – it's not really denying you the opportunity. It's denying – I mean, it is. But it's denying the public an opportunity to consume that information and learn about a wilderness area and to create that link between – wilderness in themselves so that you have future advocates for wilderness like what we were talking about that, that's the thing that i would argue and now yeah. while we're on the subject just to point out uh 
what got me interested in doing the Hell's Canyon trip was I did a trip in there with the National Wild Turkey Federation in, in order to do a story for Field and Stream. And I had a commercial photographer, still photographer, with us. We came in on a jet boat. Eight of us came in on a jet boat. I've done that jet boat trip, by the way. That's three cool. guys rode in with a with a, with a pack train. Three guys rode in with enough stock for 11 people over the mountain, down to the river. Jet boat comes in. All 11 of us then do a wall tent camp in various places through the Hell's Canyon wilderness. Wall tent camping, taking photographs for a magazine article. And I was like, I'd like to come back here with the two guys that I work with. <laughs> in this tiny little bag. Yeah, and kayak <laughs> down the river and hike up. And they're like, nah. Can't do that. <laughs> yeah, that, no, it's, it's, so, a, it's this amazing. It's not, it's not a it's not a perfect system, but I think it's that kind of stuff. It's that kind of stuff that does wind up really turning some people off. And they look and they're like, oh, it's the heavy hand of government. And they're not, they're not responsive to people's needs. And they're not open to nuance and, 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 and screw wilderness. I think it's, <laughs> because it's just a place that makes everybody confused. That's, that's what you got to overcome. That's Nephi's perspective, right? <laughs> hey, I mean, that's the thing that I'll tell you, that's the thing that frustrates me because I think that people on that side who would say like, you know, you don't get to bring your backpack in. They probably don't understand. They think they, they probably don't understand that if you do that for long enough and you don't make the right exceptions, it makes it, I mean, you, you can build up this wave of resentment mm-hmm. from people who are saying, well, well, why not? Well, why can't I go in there? You know, and, and so I think that that's the challenge for land managers to say, okay, What's the purpose of the act? What's the pragmatic solution we can find here so that we can do things the right way? How do we choose to manage this into the future? Because I think if you really jump off to one side and you say, hey, we're never, you, you don't ever get to come in here. You don't get to do these things in here. I think it makes it harder to be able to justify um, to a society that maybe doesn't care about these things as much as probably some of us do that, you know, that they should be able to exist. Yeah. There, you know, and think about what you're saying about like the different perspectives and and I think you're kind of alluding to a sort of middle ground or like finding a goal. I, I think middle ground's a good thing. Well, okay, you heard the conversation um you heard a conversation I had with Chairman Rob Bishop and, and at one point he's saying, Oh, you know, wilderness the thing is he's he's told me that um the thing is is like you can just make it over again. Like things will revert back to wilderness. And a lot of people heard that, and they were just like outraged by the sentiment. And in the moment, I was kind of outraged by the sentiment. But then, when, later in reviewing it in my mind, I could I could think of like many situations that he was probably like types of things he was alluding to. We were one time hunting in Tuskegee National Forest in Alabama, and it's low brush everywhere. There's like a lot of magnolia and oak. But at, at, at one point, I come across this large. Two straight line rows of trees, big, old, mature trees running as far as you can see through the forest. Once you climbed up in a tree and looked, you could just see them running down. And my brother explained to me, this was a plantation. This was the wagon road leading to the plantation, and these were the trees planted along the sides of the wagon road. This used to all be cotton. It's now what I thought we were in was some primordial <laughs> ancestral <laughs> Alabama forest. So there are cases when I do go and look, I'm like, you know, I do see in the when, when you're playing the long game, I do see that yeah. someone could point to stuff like that, right? It's dangerous. It, it makes though, me right? very uncomfortable. It makes me very uncomfortable. But when someone has a perspective that doesn't like jive with yours, I think it's you tend to want to look at it and just like jump on it. And it still makes me uneasy, but then I can review cases where I'm like, you know, I do sort of, like, I, I give the credit of being, I do sort of see what you were suggesting there. Yeah. And, and you think, weren't just being. And I don't want to take you me too far here because I'm not saying, hey, you know what we should have? Like, again, I think, I, it's, I don't think that's you, the challenge. I don't think that you are. And, and, and I don't think you're advocating that, but I'm just saying, like, I heard it. It was deeply offensive to me. Then only later did I go <laughs> like, you know, but I can think of situations that would pro- that are probably kind of what he has in mind. And situations where that would never work, right? Places where it won't happen. Yeah. And I mean, and I, I think that's the challenge of well, doing it right. Places where, the, where it won't happen in a certain time. Frame. Yeah. Well, yeah. It depends yeah on but earlier, I introduced the idea of looking 100 years out. Yeah. So 100 years out, um, there might be, I doubt it. 
not with the way. A hundred years out. Okay, a hundred years from now, contrary to his, no, it might be his perspective. Contrary, we we won't realize that we have net net more acres of of wild country because so much of it that used to be developed has reverted to wilderness. I just don't see that being like a general trend. So in the future when we don't need roads? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> when we're all when we're flying cars, it'll be yeah. great. Yeah. So, so what did Aldo Leopold say about, about save, saving the cog, man? You can't, you can't just rip apart the machine, mm-hmm. right? You have to keep all the different pieces so that, you know, if we, if we want to put something back together, we have to make sure that we maintain the pieces that we have in such a way that we can we can have what we want at the end of the day. You know, the, the solution is never just say, yeah, I don't think I need this piece today. Whoop, you know, it's yeah. gone. In his perspective, we didn't understand the machine. Because, like, he was coming into that, you know, he was one of the kind of the founding thinkers around this idea of these, of, of these very complex systems, you know, um, that, that, that ecology and wilderness had all these components and all these component parts need to be there, right? And you might not even understand them all. But, and I think that a lot of outdoorsmen, when they're thinking about this, they'll be like, hey, there's a lot of deer and turkeys. Everything must be cool, right? And I think a guy like like Leopold would look and be like, but there's a lot of component parts. There's a lot of gears and spindles that are missing from the system. You know, you're, you're sort of seeing these things that you're interested in, but you don't realize all the unseen parts that are missing. Yeah, that's why we're moving in a lot of ways from uh, individual species management mm-hmm. to more habitat management. And yeah. this, in science, we're not looking as much at, at species, individual species management as we are habitat management. Things like why we have disagreements about the Endangered Species Act as a, as a species-specific law versus a a habitat specific law because all of these things are viewed as you know, interacting with each other, you know, and it, it just, it, it it's you're big, right. It's this big cog. It's not an easy transition though, because no. most people can understand that singular item, that one species. Yeah. As opposed How many to deer are there? Yeah. 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 It's a much easier thing to understand than all of the other components and how the cogs all interrelate for all the beauty of, the, the of the of the pictures you know that the Aldo Leopold paints with it, his words and how he describes things, I think one of the ma- the really neat things about him and his family, if you look at his children, was how scientifically brilliant they were, just how organized and how they looked at everything and they and they and they did you know put it together logically and they added the numbers to kind of see where things were going and to measure it over time and I mean just really people who that don't know that background of him deserve to study it because it's so much more than just you know, beautiful words. You know, he used to take um, 100-yard Hail Marys at deer with his longbow. So does Dave. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't know why, I don't know why you keep coming back to this kind of stuff. I, I want to make it clear that you can add up. Well, you have to take last year's elk out, but you can add up like the last... 15 animals I've killed and not get to, to get about a three, 100 to get yards. A three, yeah, I remember you telling me that. You have to take your last 10 deer to equal a three, or I 10 messed, elk to equal yeah. a 300 yard shot. I messed up last year, though. I, uh, I killed an elk last fall at, at 202 <laughs> yards. Mm. Uh, it was an accident. And, and it was a, like, like we came up on this. You're uh, long range shooting. I, huh? Yeah, now I'm a long range shooter. I came up, I, I was hunting, I came up on this ridge, and there was this herd of elk, you know, eye level, uh, working up this mountain just, just before the sun rose. And I had one buddy with me, and he wasn't carrying a rifle. He was just there as a pack mule. And he's like, he he looks at him. He says, uh, "You gotta, you gotta shoot those elk." I'm like, "No, no, I can't. Those are like four or five hundred yards away." <laughs> he's like, "They're not four or five hundred yards away. Those things are, those things are close. You gotta shoot those elk." I'm like, take my range finder out. I mean, this all took place over five, six, seven minutes. We're watching this herd of elk graze up this uh, clearing. He pulls the range finder out, and he's like, "It's two hundred and two yards." I would have sworn it was 500. Yeah. Like, that's how, oh, well, that's how long I'll it's been one. since I, so I'm like, I guess I'm shooting an elk. So I'm like, well, it's been so long since I've taken a 200 yard shot. I'm like, I got to get my pack squared away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Take all my gear <laughs> off, you know, like, you know, and, and I, I set up and like, okay, I'll, I'll shoot this elk. He's coming from behind some aspen. I'm, like, I'm just going to wait for him to walk into me. And my buddy's back here the whole time. He's like, there's a whole herd of him. Why aren't you just, <laughs> <laughs> just, just shoot one of them? I'm, oh, it's so far. It's, so, it's got to be just right. And then I, I shot him and he, he, 
you know, hunched over like it happens when you hit them. But it was it was far enough, and I was confident in my shot. I was far enough. It t- it took off straight downhill off this mountainside, and and my buddy's like, "Great shot, great shot." I don't know if I hit him it's so far. <laughs> It, it went like yeah you start the dave wilms short range shooting school yeah <laughs> yeah he went like 20 yards crumples up and you know, it was kind of funny we packed him out can you monetize that we, we helped yeah. two other guys pack their elk out that morning too uh but a kind of transition i'm terrible at transitions terrible so i'm going to try and transition this is a good opportunity to transition real quick i don't know how much time we got left we're transition out of wilderness transition out of wilderness uh what we, what we decide? We could, what's the policy going forward i don't know i <laughs> Oh, well, well, you I can think hunt in we, wilderness in Wyoming if you come with us. We so hope, you know, I'll, I'll say one more fact about wilderness because I know you hunt in Alaska a lot, and mm-hmm. maybe, maybe you knew this, maybe you didn't. I think it's kind of uh, kind of interesting. But you know, back in the Carter administration, Jimmy Carter established 17 national monuments in in Alaska, and a couple of years later, Congress came in and designated them as national parks. Yeah, and like G- gates, as, gates of the Arctic, which is like the least visited. Yeah, that left a lot of people feeling burned. But but you know what happened? Alaska. Yeah, so you know you probably know then what happened as part of that bill as well, right? No, well I don't know. Tell me, and I'll tell you if I knew it. Yeah, so there's a reason you haven't seen any more monument designations in Alaska since then, because as a compromise to get those designated as parks, uh, and under the Wilderness Act as well in the wilderness area, took away the antiquities authority of the president to to designate wilderness and. I had no idea. Or to designate uh, monuments in Alaska. In Alaska. Only other state that has that is Wyoming. We have that uh, when Grand Teton National Park was expanded and changed from a monument to a park. They made a big deal? Made a big deal. deal. Same kind of bill said president can't use the antiquity authority to designate any more monuments in in Wyoming. So those two states. Okay, now here's the the deal. If we were having a conversation, and this is where like personal preference comes in, if we were having a conversation about park designations, I would have a very different perspective on it. Oh man! So Why this? Oh, I was gonna say this sounds like this could this could go on for a while. Well, I'm not gonna be able. To, I shouldn't have. I, I transitioned and then pivoted back. But anyway, go ahead. No, I, I, if I was looking at it, I would say that. Um, and this is deeply informed by per, this is deeply informed by personal perspective. But uh, I don't think that. In, in it, like, if you look at the wilderness, like how the Wilderness Act works, I don't think that regulated hunting and fishing. Like are detrimental to the mission of wilderness, and that's generally been accepted in non-park wilderness areas. When you look at a place like the Gates of the Arctic, that was monument became park, and now, like I says, not it's like the least visited national park. It's enormous. I just cannot see. I cannot accept that. That excluding public hunting was the right move for that place. Like, I don't know what you gained from it. Yeah. And it might be park specific, right? That one's... Yeah. And that, no, that, but here's a case, like, people like be like, oh, you're locked out. And here's a case where, here's a case where you had, like, a monument designation, became a park, you had a place that used to be hunted, now it's not. Um, and there's not, like, a lot of activities that filled in in the place of that. It just seemed like a, it seemed like a bad call. So it's basically a, a big W wilderness that has the tagline of park over the top of it yeah. that takes what would have been permitted activities the ability to hunt off the away. table. Yeah. yeah, it's like you just like, you know, yeah. there there was a, it was a it was a loss, it was a hunter access loss that I feel was that I feel was just misguided and and not really and not constructive. And it became kind of one of these things of as we apply labels to places, what are the you know, what are the activities and prohibitions that go along with it? I'd be comfortable with you know, I'd be comfortable with any sort of designations that made sense around access and all kinds of other stuff. But I think just like excluding activity, like excluding an activity like hunting, regardless of how you're going about it, in terms of how you're accessing the landscape, I think it was a bad. Is, is like hunting bad part call. of what should be there naturally? Well, there still is some hunting there, like Alaska natives. There's there still is some hunting that can go on there. But as far as you know, as far as like like general public ability to hunt. Um, you can still access places, but that's been, that's like an activity that's been eliminated there for, I don't understand why. So this creates a great segue, actually. Please. Hunting, generally, not just in wilderness, but just generally. Right versus privilege. Hunting, well, more and more, hunting speak, is, more and more, speak, like a lot of states are making it a right. 
Yeah, sort of. Sort of. Well, a lot of states have, there's states that have come in with, like, they're trying to, like, craft legislation that protects future infringements on hunting that would come from a place outside of a fish and game agency. Yeah, so you've got, you've got like, 22 states, almost half of the states now that have, that have established, protected some sort of, uh, identified either a right or, like, in the case of Montana, I think Montana Supreme Court has actually said it's, it hasn't gone so far as to declare it a right. They've said it's protecting a way of life or a heritage, yeah. uh, which stops just short of a right. Wyoming's is viewed as one of the more affirmative. Uh, you know, it, it falls. It's a constitutional provision that falls in the Declaration of Rights portion of the Wyoming Constitution. So hunting, fishing, trapping. Wyoming. Yeah, it's because it's like a right. it's like a thing that you can get. In, in, in certain states have done it, and I, I love it that they've done it. And the states that have done it are places where it's just like a nice score, overwhelming support. Yeah, we I, like we had something like eighty five percent of the population adopted this constitutional amendment. Yeah, but then you have places where it's failed, uh, which like Maine, which I kind of associate Maine as a. Uh, there's a lot of hunting in Maine. Right. But then, you know what else failed? Like a catastrophic failure was their ban on, their like effective ban on black bear hunting. Right. That's true. Yeah. In, in a public referendum. Yeah. No, that's true too. So <laughs> it's, it's sort of this, it, 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 Maine's kind of an enigma, I guess, in yeah, some ways, right? It, it really is. Uh, but, uh, so is it really, so we have states that have, have made this declaration. Mm-hmm. Of, so you, do you view that as a, because there are a lot of arguments against it. Do you view it as a good thing that states are out front you know, trying to um, trying to create these either rights or protection of of hunting heritage? With the, I think they always leave wiggle room for their state departments of game and fish to yeah so to manage appropriately. But. I think that yeah, it's hard to come in and say like no one's ever going to come past law and say hey unfettered access to all hunting and fishing reg- no regulations whatsoever. What, what you're trying to do is you're trying to... We already to, did that. It kind of failed. Yeah, we already <laughs> yeah, we tried that for 100 years. Yeah. Um, I think what you're trying to create is you're, you're, you're trying to create some language. You're trying to codify this idea that wildlife will be administered by a state fish and game agency as, a, as to create renewable resource usage by the public as they see fit keeping in mind that they need to manage species in perpetuity so it's not saying that like no matter what happens you will be able to hunt turkeys even if there's only three left no one's suggesting that but you're trying to like create you're trying to create space for wildlife managers not you're trying to create protections for wildlife managers to be able to Use wildlife as a renewable resource that people can can have access to, and not have it be that you could that you would have people come in, that you would have outside interests come in or, or public referendums come in and deny them the ability to do so. You're allowing them to manage, allowing them to manage. So yeah. you could get to, but feasibly, you could get to a position. Let's say I don't know, it's hard to even imagine. But let's say you wound up being that the wildlife resources were decimated, right? You could get to a position where there was no legal hunting in a place because they've deemed that we don't have harvestable populations. We don't have harvestable numbers of wildlife. You can still get to a position where everyone is wishing that that we could allow hunting, but we just can't allow hunting because of some, you know, hypothetical scenario in which there's not enough wildlife to be hunted. But so it seems to me though that the so the constitutional amendments that the states have passed team, seem to fall into two categories. You have the one category that's that really establishes hunting as a as a fundamental right yes. of a citizen of that state to be able to hunt, fish, trap, and some. It depends on the state when when when, de- when, when deemed appropriate right, by a management agency. Right, but but it's still a right. And so the idea then that, that you could have this. I think the idea behind that one is you couldn't get outside influences that were from, say, an uh, anti-hunting group that managed to hypothetically, say, uh, fill up a Game and Fish Commission yeah. and say, no more hunting, even if populations would allow for it. Yeah, no more hunting what, of yeah, anything. That's what you're trying that's to prevent. That's what you're trying to prevent. Uh, the, the other category is, 
I think a little bit more squishy. The states like Montana, for example, I think it's a little bit more squishy where it's recognizing the heritage of the state and the country and that hunting was part of the the heritage, but it doesn't actually create a right to hunt. Yeah. And so, so was that just like a so fun thing it's to almost do? Like like it's, th- it's like a fun rule. It's almost like a pass? feel good. Yeah. It's yeah, a statement. It's a statement of policy, uh, gotcha. a, a state position of policy rather than protecting an actual right. And I, th- I think when you really parse these out, the states fall in different categories. The U.S. Supreme Court's weighed in on it, uh, at least under the U.S. Constitution. Oh, it's, what's their take on it? So this one came out of Montana, too, back in the early 90s. said it's not a fundamental right. Hunting is not a fundamental right. I mean, because you can, uh, have your right, you can have your rights revoked. Well, but, you know, Second Amendment, you, you, is that a fundamental right? You can have that revoked, too, for felonies. And so I got forth. you. Yeah. I got you. So any, any right can be, in some ways, revoked. It's, it's not limitless. None of, the, none of our rights are it's limitless. It's just a higher bar. It's just a much higher bar. Yeah. And they're saying hunting doesn't reach that much higher bar within the federal I got you. context. But it's applied differently, you know, in the... In the state system, so it, it, but but we have that interesting. Now we have that interesting case law. So if if you had folks that really wanted to see hunting go away on a national level, you'd focus on focus your policy push on the national level where the supremacy clause of the Constitution applies, and you could create policy that that would supersede these state constitutional amendments. Yeah, because uh, in, in some states, and you might not know which ones. In some states, there have been cases where. The public has been able to sue the management agency for saying we have a resource that could with that, that that could support limited harvest, but you're not allowing access to it, and you're not you're, you're denying access not based on the sustainability of the population. It, it's some other thing that's happened in California, mountain lions in California. Okay. I think California banned hunting mountain lions. Yeah, they did. Right. But now, in certain places, they're having so many conflicts that the wildlife the wildlife agency is having to come in and administratively remove lions. Yeah, they're they're killing several hundred a year. Right, but people, you know, hunters can't do it. Hunters can't they, do it. Yeah, but, and California is interesting. They have a constitutional amendment that protects fishing, but not hunting. Oh, they do. Yeah, uh, and it's kind of interesting when you. And I think you alluded to it a little bit. If you were to lay a map of the U.S. out of which states have have done these. Uh, uh, Hunting amendments. Yeah, it, 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 it's the ones you'd expect, right? For the most part. Yeah, or people really feel they good about nice going on doing college. it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, you know, I've never viewed it like I, I, I never sit back and view it as. Um, I never view. I never talk about it or view it as a, a as a fundamental right. And even though the, like that kind of thing like has legal definitions, as you've alluded to, and I'm just not educated on it, but. I guess I haven't viewed it that way because it's always like pending, pending a resource. Okay, so like there were times when, like right now, you can hunt turkeys in forty-nine states. There were times when you could not hunt turkeys in the majority of states. There weren't enough, so I wouldn't say like, do you have a fundamental right to hunt turkeys? Like pending an available resource. Yeah. Right, and the other thing is, it's very easy to lose your hunting privileges. Um. By breaking laws and, and, and doing things the same way as like when someone says like you have a fundamental right to drive a car, I'd be like, I, I guess probably not. I guess well, you probably don't have a fundamental right to drive a car. Yeah, I'd say you don't have a fundamental right. To, there's no right to drive a car. That's totally a privilege, right? Yeah. Uh, but so like fundamental some right, some fundamental right to vote. You know, like we agree with this fundamental right to vote, and there's a very high bar to lose. You know, it's like difficult to lose your voting rights. Yeah. And it's that's how like that's how it is for that's supposed to be how it is for hunting in a lot of these states, right? That that was the idea behind these, which which I dig. Yeah, I would support that. Like I would support it on a national level. But I think the whole the whole movement is just to recognize our you know, underlying national heritage. I mean that this is a country that was really built upon the backs of folks that survived hunting and angling. But people aren't going to care about that in the future. It's, it's I know, really, but the fact but that we've been the fact that we've been doing something doesn't matter to people. No, that but much. it's but it's amazing to me how not far removed we are from it. Like I think about that sometimes. So my grandfather was born in 1908. His grandfather, so I guess my great great grandfather, came out on the Oregon Trail, on the Mormon Trail, uh, and settled Montpelier, Idaho, right. That's chased not Butch like Cassidy my, on a bicycle. No, that was my great grandfather actually chased Butch Cassidy. Uh, oh. Yeah, yeah, this, yeah. 
Yeah. Did they exchange gunfire? They did not exchange gunfire. <laughs> so Butch Cassidy it's came an old in. old bicycle. Butch Cassidy, good. Yeah, Butch Cassidy uh, came into Montpelier, Idaho in 1896. Uh, broad daylight. Came into the first Montpelier First National Bank, or whatever it was called at the time, uh, with a couple of his, uh, his gang. And robbed the bank, middle of the day. My great-grandfather was a sheriff's deputy, or the deputy sheriff in Montpelier, Idaho at the time. Saw this happen. Didn't have a horse nearby, but there was a bicycle leaning up against the, uh, the the bank or next door to the bank. So he got on his bicycle and chased Butch Cassidy out of town on his bike uh, until he could get catch up with somebody that had horses. And they chased him into Wyoming, into the hills outside Wyoming. They actually they actually caught uh, one or two members of the gang, but not Butch Cassidy himself. Uh, and prosecuted him there in in Montpelier. Oh, yeah? yeah, yeah. He died. But, was he died in? Uh, Argentina, right? Yeah, the rumor has it. Some say he some lives on. Some lives say he lived on. Right? Yeah, they lived on. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, so but it's we're just not that far removed. Like my great great grandfather was a pioneer coming across the West, settling Montpelier, Idaho in 1863, and survived on hunting and fishing. Well, mainly hunting, uh, coming across the West. And my grandfather, who I was close to, was close to him. And it, I mean, it's just that one degree of separation yeah. really right now to that initial heritage. They would have agreed with the fundamental right idea. I think they would have. You oh, know, yeah, I think they would have. Th- that's the big danger when we start talking about two things that you started with. You started with talking about wilderness. We started talking about land. We started talking about access to that land and then hunting. Now, these are things that are, you know, our access to these things, they can't be taken for granted. You know, it'd be ridiculous to think that either of those things is finite. That, you know, that you, it, it's not that, that way. It's that you can, that there aren't decisions that could be made and that would take those opportunities away from all of us. Yeah, you know, I think opportunities that, to access those places and do those things. I look at it like as far as I feel like you're always waging a two pronged. It's like a two pronged battle. As for for me, like from my perspective, as an outdoorsman, is like I'm one one of the battles you're waging is like to have places for wildlife, right? So it's like a habitat fight or an ecology fight or whatever it is like to maintain space for wildlife to exist the other battle is it's social and you're fighting to maintain access to it and so and, and these are like conflicting there's different enemies man yeah. <laughs> it's different enemies. you're right and that's the challenge right now is like we have to you know we have this tent we have to get more people into this tent of sharing that, you know, of, 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 you know, I said missionary before preaching that gospel of saying, look, this is, you know, this is important. This is important to you as an individual. It's important to us. You know, it sounds cheesy to say it's our heritage, but I mean, it's just important to, it's important to the soul of who we are as a people and as a nation is to have those opportunities in this country. Yeah, you got it. But I mean, it takes a lot to get people to coalesce. I mean, we got cozy with the Russians to deal with the Nazis, Right. And then once the Nazis are gone, we got right back to got right back to our squabble, and that turned into a pretty big squabble. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I love this idea when people are talking about like getting you know all these you know these disparate interests to come together, but uh, it takes a hell of an enemy. It takes a hell of an <laughs> enemy to get disparate interests together. That's a that's a good point. No. Um. So we've used a lot of your time. I wanted to ask you one last question. Please transitioning again. So you're going on a podcast tour this summer Mm -hmm. where are you going so i'm curious where are you going and what made you decide to do this this we tour? we did one live show um we did one live show last summer and just kind of as a test run and it worked out Uh, it was a lot of fun and 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 people liked we just did a theater in bozeman montana um and then liked it so much in fact that now we're doing four more dates and we'll keep adding dates. So, uh, we're doing Denver, Colorado, Columbus, Ohio, Tempe, Arizona, Minneapolis, Minnesota. And, um, those are all sold out or about sold out. And then we'll probably add some more dates. And then next winter we'll probably do a big, you know, big, like a a bigger tour next winter. So what's your preference? Uh, So you've only done one of these live, only done one live show. Just to see, see like, because we just had yeah. to do one to see. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, okay, that was cool. Now we're going to do four to see what that's like. And then, and then like, I think we're, I think we're already, we're already going to start adding some more in. 
Um, cause it's kind of, you know, it's kind of a big jump, right? So we, we started out with theaters that are anywhere from 400 to a thousand just in different markets to kind of like find out like what you could actually pull off. And you're fine. You're fine. Those are selling out, huh? Yeah. 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 Um, well, awesome. we sold one out very quickly and the other ones are almost sold out. So, so, so people need to get their tickets fast if they want to see it. It might already might be, too, it might already be too late, man. <laughs> no, that's a, that's exciting. It so, might already be too late. So, do you think this might be the the wave of the future for you on podcast? Well, we're definitely not. Yeah, I mean, we definitely didn't invent the idea. Yeah, yeah, uh, that's true. You know, uh, it, it's you know, other people, other people were, were were there first, so it's it's more like taking something that uh, that, that seemed to work for other people, like in very different spaces. But you know, it, it's funny. I remember. Um, someone saying to me one time, he was talking about how people will come up, like if people watch your show or listen to your show, and they'll come up and be like, oh, I feel like I know you. Like how weird it would be when someone that you don't know at all says that. But you want to be like, yeah, well, in some, to some degree, you probably do. Because if you listen to, you know, a hundred and some episodes that are a couple hours each, and someone's like listening to all that after a while they probably get like some fairly good sense of like what is going on in your world right and i think that um you know people want to come and and kind of like have that experience of being around and sort of seeing how things actually go and it's, it's like a form of it's almost like a form of theater form of entertainment you go to people go to lectures yeah all the time like i give keynotes and lectures and stuff like that so it's kind i think it's just kind of like a more fun maybe funnier version of going to something like that and uh and it's it, it's enjoyable to go do it um uh, i don't know that it's constructive in the way of of like building an audience but it might be i guess you'll find out yeah yeah after t-shirts. i've done more of them yeah we'll do t-shirts yeah Fireworks. we've been we've been uh we've been working up a actual dedicated live t-shirt Wow. So, yeah. If you like the old days, you get your Motley Crue live kind of <laughs> t-shirt. I was, I was just telling, I think I was telling these guys the other day that I have a, a Bush. Remember the band Bush? Uh, I have, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought I, you were talking about Bush beer. No, no. So I have a, I have a the band Bush a t-shirt from their, I think it was a 96 tour. But I was too cheap to buy. History hasn't been kind to Bush. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> but but I had I, I had this T-shirt. I bought it out of some guy's, you know, the back of some guy's uh, truck for like four dollars, and I put it on and shocking, like, like you could see through. <laughs> <laughs> like so, so they got to buy your actual shirt. They can't buy a, a cheap knockoff. Is my is my point. Out of Dave's in, in, our, in our special live, our special live shirt, we're only going to sell at the live events. So when so you see Dave that shirt, you'll won. know that that dude was at the show, or but, but that's, he knows someone who but was. But that's what happened. I bought this this yeah. Bush shirt that was the same one. And you're, and you're an yeah, imposter. Be careful. Yeah, you watch Dave like a hawk. And the guy just disappeared. You know? yep. this and you're an imposter have... now, and people think like, oh, that dude was a visionary. He went to see Bush live. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Way back in 96. Yeah. Did it disintegrate so, already? I probably still have it. I bet you. I'll, I'll, wear, right. I'll wear. I'll wear it to work or something. Yeah. Did you? Uh, do you? Do you? Uh, did I hear correctly that you're running a Nirvana shirt right now? I, I, you know, <laughs> I don't like to brag. <laughs> I don't like to brag, but uh, yeah, yeah. My, the so funny my, thing is, he didn't even realize that. that he was doing this since we're coming thing? here. No, my daughter's got it for me uh, three months ago. Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I really, I actually really like. He shows Nirvana's up last night to get on the plane teenager. wearing that shirt. Really, really Dave? <laughs> going to Seattle wearing a Nirvana shirt. Yeah, we pass through his hometown. Is that, is that every, time, every time we go dig clams, we pass through his hometown, man. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm just. This is in memoriam. Yeah, yeah you're in the yeah, right. You're yeah. in the zone yeah, now. You're right. thoughtful. You're a thoughtful a thought, guy. I had to cover it up because these guys gave yeah. me so much. When the wind's right, you can step out here and still smell it, man. You can still <laughs> smell the the, 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 the Nirvana legacy. Uh, yeah, yeah, you still but... smell the teen spirit. <laughs> So, so last last thing, you, circling all the way back to the oh, so we covered the live tour. We covered the live tour, yeah. Can I plug you, you, this you website? Plug, yeah, please do. Yeah, go to meateater.live and so you'll see if there's any tickets. We'll, so we'll, we'll announce more. So different than your normal, than your meet Yeah, and I'll, even, I'll not even bore you with why that is, but yes. Okay. So different. Me, <laughs> so not the meat eater, it's just meateater.live. Meat live. Meat eater. live to get tickets. Yeah. When will this go up? Uh, That's a great question, Steve. So I'm glad you asked. Might be too late. Well, no, no, we'll see. no, it's not going to be too late. It's we'll not going to be too late. Okay. No, no, it Good. might be too late for people that actually want to buy tickets, but it's not going to be too late for uh, you know. Uh, it'll be before your show. Your yeah, but I'm saying, the might, you know, but they'll be all, all be sold out. So it, no. it depends. I hope, on it is, I hope a lot of people go on and like 
dang, they're sold out. Next time I'm gonna be fast. That's right. Well, <laughs> next time I'm gonna spring. Bigger venue. Yeah. We've got a. We'll get you a venue. Yeah, you want a football stadium? We I can have, do that. You I'm know not I quite can. ready. For, probably not ready for a football stadium. This is like a little. You know I dinky, can make that happen, Steve. You just yeah, that's do. an intimidating stadium. Now, how many how many seats is that? Oh, twenty thousand. And then you fill in the. No, not no, quite no, there, yeah. no, no. Yeah. We're talking about. We're talking about the one Laramie. we did. The, we did that podcast oh, yeah. in a couple years ago. That's that, intimidating. Oh, that's twenty. Yeah. That's, that's twenty five. Twenty thousand. So that's like a significant percentage of the population of your boys. It state. becomes. It becomes oh, yeah. the. Fourth largest city in the state, I think. That when, stadium does. When there's a home football game. Yeah. 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 Uh, we only so, got a half million people in the whole state. Yeah, just shade over that. We're, we're holding pretty steady. Yeah. Steady for yeah. years and years. So the, right, it's the, the, next it's the sage so the, grouse yeah, turds so the that last, make you sneeze. Last thing I wanted to ask you, you, you know, circling all the way back to the beginning with sage grouse, you know, the, and you were talking about uh, you're going to air that, say, that sage grouse hunt before too Oh, my God. When, so when's, when's that going to happen? When are we going yeah, to right see more? Soon. 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 It's a great. Dude, we have a whole. Yeah, we have 16 episodes that we're finishing right now. And that's in that 16 episode lap. So the 100th episode of Meat Eater is hiding within season seven. That's how many of those shows Ooh. we've made. Wow. Over 100. Wow. And we have 16 that will be made available soon. But it's been like a. It's been a sort of a tumultuous time so they're gonna changing be, media yeah land. yeah it's so, changing yeah. media landscape and, uh, yeah so not to get into that but uh Please, yeah i yeah. don't want to yeah because i don't like to say anything until it happens for yeah real. yeah but i don't like to talk about stuff because but you're know, excited you can about get it. burned about I know, oh, uh, very I know, excited yeah, but I know um, a lot of people are i i've heard from people i got i've got friends that enjoy your show and i hear from and they want to know, the they know, know it. You know, where yeah. where's it going when are we gonna see it you it, know, we it, don't. It, it, it's it's there. It's just been a um, it's just been a it's been a long process. But yeah, it'll all be it'll it'll all be widely available. Yeah, you deserve a ton of credit, whether on purpose or an accident. You are a fantastic voice for the sportsman's community. You are really one of the top. I mean, you are you're the you're the prophet in the in that in that church. No. So you know, thank you for the work thank that you, you do there. You're sincerely, it's it's a privilege to know you, and thanks the, for letting us spend some time with you the today. Prophet in that church. That's a pretty big. Uh, I know. Wow. I just need to find out what church it is. <laughs> <laughs> Don't ask Dave. The hunting and fishing church. Yeah. But but it, yeah, really thank you. Uh, thanks for taking the time. I know we've used up a lot of your valuable time, and well, I appreciate you guys and, uh, taking the time to have me on, and I. Hope you'll spend a little time burning some sage grouse droppings. I spent a lot of time burning sage grouse <laughs> droppings, and, and yeah, and good luck with you guys' project, man. I think that um, doing something like this and talking about focusing on policy issues and and helping to explain like pretty complex ideas is good is time well spent. I appreciate it. Uh, so that's it. This is uh, this has been the Your Mountain Podcast. Thanks for listening. Tune in next time and. We'll have some more great discussion. Mike here from the Your Mountain Podcast. We need a favor. Go on our website, itsyourmountain.com, and find the links to Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram so that you can like and follow us, and also so that you can share us with your friends. Wherever you got this podcast from, go ahead and click subscribe, rate us, and leave a comment. These simple things will really help us get the word out. That's itsyourmountain.com. Thanks for the help.